All right. Welcome to episode number two of the Chasing Waypoints podcast. This time around, we are talking a little bit more about route planning and the do's and don'ts and stuff like that. But uh, I think what we'll do is we'll start it off with an adventure. So stay tuned for that. We'll see you guys in just a sec. All right, so story time on this one. So talking about the subject, right, of the podcast this time around, episode two, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about route planning and the story that I had. I've been thinking about this all week, you know, like, hey, what's, you know, what's a good example? You know, what's some stuff that I've done in the past that it pretty much came around and bit me or us in the ass uh, for not doing this. And so there's been one that's probably the most memorable, uh, which was several years ago. This was one of the uh, the score uh, San Felipe 250 races. And we were down there pre-running, um, just checking the race course out, trying to get an idea, a feel for it. Um, that was back when we were racing uh, Baja Bugs 5-1600. And it's challenge it's a very challenging class so you have to do your homework because it's the stuff that's in the dust that's going to get you uh and then back then you know gps's really weren't a thing you know it was all it was all course markers and remembering where things were and it's really important to remember that remembering where things are so you know long story short sort of uh we're out in the middle of nowhere um pre-running uh, it is my godfather. Uh, we've got my dad. We got another friend uh, and his dad, and then myself. And we're in the uh, we have a Volkswagen thing at the time that we're pre-running in, and uh, I'm on my friend's quad, and we're we're taking turns, you know. And so having a ball, it's a good, you know, good day. We're running south of San Felipe, going through this whole thing, going through all these washes and all that stuff. And the washes south of San Felipe, uh, Chanate, Matomi, and uh, Guatamote, all are very interesting. They can be completely blank slate, clean, like they took an eraser through it. Or if it's been a while since water's been ran down through it, it's whooped out rough and just trashy. Real narrow canyons, rocks all over the place in some of them. So, It really gets interesting really, really fast. So you want to know where that stuff is. Um, So pre-running, doing our thing. You know, it's getting later on in the day. You know, we're running, running, running. And, you know, we're doing good, making up good time. And it's starting to get kind of dark. And, you know, we're we're moving along. And, you know, we stop to take a break. And we start to realize, you know, man, we're we're getting a little lower on on gas, right? And this thing's been modified. So it carries 11 gallons in the front. We've got a 10-gallon tank in the back. So 20... What is that? 21 gallons. So it's not bad for that. And Volkswagen engine, and you're not pushing it hard, so it's not really using a lot of fuel. Um, so, you know, we notice the front tank starting to run out. And, you know, all right, cool. We'll turn on the back tank. We'll run it off the back tank. No problem. So we keep going. It's getting dark. We're getting into this wash. And, you know, we're starting to figure it out. And my dad's doing the driving. And he's like, yeah, you know, it's it's got an exit. And you kind of come up. And then all of a sudden, you just jump out of the wash. And, you know, there you are. So... It had been a little bit since we had seen a course marker, which was a bit of a red flag, right? But, you know, in the moment you think, well, you know, where they haven't finished marking it or whatever it is. You know, we're, we're out there early trying to get this pre-run in. Um, so, you know, we didn't really think a lot of it. Well, we're going, we're going, we're going, we're do, doing this wash. And, you know, we think, man, you know, this is getting a little long in the tooth. We stopped to take a break, you know, we've regrouped, everybody's, you know, there, and then, you know, hey, how much gas do we have? Well, we go back and look at the tank, and it's getting kind of low. You know, I remember looking in there, and I could see the bottom of it fairly easily, Um, so we're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, you know, this isn't good. So, we're, you know, at that point, we're like, okay, well, it's getting dark, this is getting a little bit sketchy, Um, you know, the best we should do is actually stop and wait uh, for morning, right? We're, we're going to do it. We're going to spend the night on in the desert. So, you know, you think it's, it's not too bad, you know, San Felipe in the round, the February time, uh, it's not too cold, but you know, the Canyon that we happen to be in, they had this little like two mile an hour breeze constant would not stop. And that eventually adds up and it gets cold and, you know, your body temperature drops and, 
you know, I feel bad. My dad, uh, we had put all of our jackets in the front. Well, I had a green jacket that I was running, right? It was just the dark earth or flat or whatever they call that flat earth. <laughs> um, and we're, you know, I put it in there, threw it in there. And I said, well, my dad looked and when he opened the front hood and saw, oh, the green jacket, oh, my jacket's already in there. So we get, you know, we get down there and opens it up and no jacket, you know, and and literally they were the same exact color. So it's totally, you know, could have happened any other day. But anyway, so we're down. I mean, obviously we're in this canyon. Everybody's quiet because we don't know what's going on. You know, we're in the middle of nowhere. We don't really know anymore where we're at. You know, we know we're headed in the right direction, but we just really don't know where we're at. Um, so we ended up burning a tree that was in the, uh, in the wash to try and stay warm. And, you know, we heated up some rocks and took the doors off the thing and tried to kind of make us a uh, shelter, you know, so that we could sleep. But it was so bad that, I mean, like you could sleep maybe 10 or 15 minutes at a time and then you would wake up because you were just so cold, you know, shivering. So we set this tree on fire and you would think, you know, this, this thing was pretty big and it was dried out, you know. And we lit the thing on fire, and it probably lasted three hours. Like, this is a full-size bush tree. I mean, this is a huge piece of, piece of wood sitting in the wash. So, you know, we burned through that. Starting to get daylight. The wind's picking up a little bit more. You know, this is after doing the rotisserie thing and, you know, on a 15-minute sleep rotation and all that stuff. So, everybody kind of wakes up. And my friend's dad, you know, takes off and, and climbs up this hill that were that was kind of right next to where we were at. It was a little bit of a ways up, you know. And so we go, okay, cool. So he's going up there. He's going to have a big point of, an, point of view. We'll be able to see kind of where we're at when he comes back. You know, we'll figure out our game plan. Well, he comes back down. And by the tone of my voice, you could tell it was not the news that we wanted to hear. Couldn't see anything. Couldn't see the city. Couldn't see anything. And... We would have come out close enough to where we would have seen some kind of civilization, you know, and but nothing. So it was one of those things that, you know, now we're like, okay, this isn't good. We had a five-gallon container of gas that we had started with, and we were putting that in the quad. That was the gas for the quad. So the decision was made that my dad and my friend's dad were going to uh, jump on the quad, uh, take that last of the gas and, and make their way out. You know, we figured that we were in a wash and it had to lead to the water, had to lead to the Sea of Cortez. So they took off, you know, they went and they were gone. And, you know, and then, so it's three of us back where we're at and, you know, we're starting to think, you know, man, this isn't good. You know, they've been gone a while. You know, we didn't really come up with a game plan. Like, Hey, if we're not back by, you know, 10 call dominoes or whatever, you know, it was like, we didn't really know. We figured they knew and everybody knew where we had to go, the direction we had. We just didn't have any idea how far it actually was. So this is, you know, we're three hours in. I don't know. It's almost getting to noon. You know, sun's beating down and it's still kind of cool. But, you know, you, you know, you're getting baked out in the sun and, um, you know, no, uh, no condors or whatever flying around yet, you know, circle or buzzards or whatever cir- circling. So we're good so far. Um, so we're sitting there talking and just, you know, kind of nervously talking and my friend, uh, goes and jumps on the front of the car and just kind of shakes it. Well, we're sitting there all of a sudden I hear some sloshing. What the hell? You know, it's like, where's that? I go do that again. He does it again. And you start hearing the sloshing and going, holy hell. So all the gas that was in the back the gas that wasn't being used or maybe every time we were stopping was actually transferring to the front tank. Um, So we obviously we had more gas than we had thought. And I was like, okay, there's hope. So we decide, okay, we're going to wait till, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. This was years ago. So one o'clock. And if they're not back by one, we're going to have to make a run for it to the water. This is a wash. There's really not a whole lot of places to come back in and, and do that. So, said, all right. So one o'clock rolls around, nothing, not, not a single, you know, no, no bike. And this thing had a loud exhaust on it too. So we would have heard a quad coming back even in distance. And sometimes 
you'd get those little rumblings where it was like, oh, wait, that could that? No, mm, no. So it could have been another bike two canyons over that was pre-running, and we were just in the wrong place. You know, we figured the other thing is if we're on the course, somebody's going to come through here at some point, you know, and see us. Well, that didn't happen. So 1 o'clock rolled around, and we said, all right, let's do this. So uh, with my godfather driving, um, you know, we decided, all right, let's take off. So aired down the tires a little bit. Um, you know, we're sitting in the back seat, you know, keeping, keeping the front end, trying to keep the front end lighter. Cause it's obviously it's a sand wash and, you know, Volkswagen thing, you know, weighs as small as a German tank. They kind of look like a German tank, but we get moving, we're underway. We're going through this and all of a sudden we start getting stuck. You know, we get, you know, it's getting kind of sketchy. So, uh, we have to jump off and push and do that. And, you know, we were just, we were just moving. And eventually got to the point where we were actually standing on the back bumper holding on to the roof part of the cage. Uh, me and my friend Pete, and we're back there. It was like if we were firemen, you know, just hanging off the back of this thing. And, you know, we're going through it, and and, and my godfather, he's doing his best, you know, picking his way through it. Because this thing has no suspension. I mean, this was like the stock ball joint suspension at that point. So it really didn't have any kind of suspension to speak of. Uh, you know, dual Bilstein shocks in the rear without a reservoir. I mean, this is like old school. And um, so we're going through it. We're moving. We're moving. You know, we're like firefighters. And then all of a sudden we round this corner and I just see blue. And it was just this relief. Like, there's the Sia Cortez. You instantly could tell it was the Sia Cortez. I was thinking, it's the Sia Cortez. All right. You know, there's the beach, you know. And it's, uh, I'm thinking, you know, we get to the beach and, you know, we either walk north or we walk south, you know, we're going to run across somebody fishing camp or whatever. We'll, we'll be able to figure it out. So we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going. And, and we come around this corner and we're going and, you know, getting stuck and trying not to get stuck and it's getting sketchy and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, there's a road and we're like, what the hell? Like, we weren't expecting it, but I mean, it makes all the sense that it would be there. Um, Highway five, I believe it was was at the time. Well, no sooner than we were pulling up, uh, out of nowhere, out of this bush, I start hearing yelling, and they're calling us. And I look over, and it's my friend's dad. And so he's, you know, he's laying. He had the quad and stuff, kind of stuffed into a bush. He's in the shade, you know, hiding from the sun, and you know, he's yelling at us and stop and turn and. He's like, what happened? And, you know, we gave him the whole rundown. Hey, you know, the, all the gas went up to the front tank. And, da, da, da. and I'm like, well, where's my dad? And it turns out that they had flagged down one of the local fishermen guys that was coming through. And he hitched a ride with them. Uh, you know, explained the situation and what was going on. And so he ended up uh, hitching a ride with them back to San Felipe. So at this point, we really didn't know where we were. Um, it was then my friend's dad that filled us in and said, yeah, we're, we're like 20 or 30 miles south of Puertecitos. So we were supposed to come out at about that level of Puertecitos, uh, which is south of San Felipe by, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 minutes, something like that. I don't know. I'd have to look it up on a map. You figured I would know this. Um, and it was just like, what like we were we were way south of where we were supposed to be um so you know well what happened we said well we flagged down this fisherman your dad took off with them they went into town they're getting gas and they're getting food and blah 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 and they're coming back so you know and they finally a couple hours pass you know we're just hanging out and you know and you know here comes my here comes my dad with this guy and this fisherman my dad's got this look on his face because i guess apparently this this was before they fixed the road so these local guys know every single pothole. They have names for them. They know how deep they are. They know the cousins, the aunts, the uncles. They know everything about these potholes. So they drive like they know everything about these potholes. Um, it's very quite impressive. Anyway, so they come back. You know, we're shooting there. You know, we explain the whole thing. Oh, it's all the gas that went to the front tank, and da da da. And then you know, right away we're thinking like, oh, when we get back, we're gonna do this, this, and that. You know, and so that worked out. You know, hit that stuff. We go back, and now we're we're on our way back. 
uh, to San Felipe, you know, cruising on the highway. We were just happy to, you know, be back and, and getting there and, um, and just getting putting this thing behind us. But the real big lesson that I learned in all of this was exactly that, that you don't necessarily know all the time exactly where you're at. But remembering where things are will help you, you know, more or less, I guess to say is like leaps of faith. So if I know like when I'm planning a route, I try and memorize land markers or things that will actually show up in a satellite image. Um, like when you're using Google Maps, uh, Google Earth, uh, things like that. Like you can zoom in enough to where you can kind of pick up some, you know, abandoned ranches and things like that. And and then you kind of remember like, okay, yeah, on the map it's, you know, we're going to head up this and we're just a little bit further up. And then you say, so in between those points, if you know you're hitting those those points, then you know you're on the right track. Well, things change in the desert and, and roads change and, and things like that. But usually big things like that will not change. You know, you can use fields for reference, you know, a farmer's field. Well, just because the field was green when you looked at it in the satellite image, well, that field is still there. It's just brown now because, well, you're in, you know, in the middle of the summer. So there's there's ways of, of memorizing things and doing things. And in that case, you know, we, we really didn't know the course. This was really before GPS was, was involved and where you could literally, I mean, nowadays, you load the chip on the thing, you zoom the thing into 300 feet, and you go to town. You know, you don't even need to pre-run technically. Obviously, you want to, and especially the faster the cars are, you know, the better, uh, or the more notes that you want to do. And then the same thing with with motorcycles and things like that. I think with motorcycles, it's a lot more important um, to kind of see and know the areas, and they're very selective of the areas that they pre-run. I feel, um, but for good case, I mean, no roll cage and one get off could be the last one. So, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into it. But the big thing was is that now the advantage of GPS is more readily available to us, but we shouldn't forget how to do things the old school way, memorize things and, and, and know, you know, waypoints in certain areas and things that you know, that are important to the trip and to getting to where you need to be. Um, intersections, big intersections are something to remember. You know, you want to make sure you're, you're good. Excuse me. Totally not going to edit that sneeze out. It was healthy. Sip of my large beverage there. But um, it really does make a difference when you remember that kind of stuff. And, and, and it allows you to not be so focused on the GPS because you know you're on the right track. You know, the GPS, you always want to use it for reference and, and that kind of thing. But especially on a two-wheel motorcycle, if you're glued to the GPS, uh, you're going to have issues. I mean, that's just... And I don't know anybody that's glued to the GPS and hasn't had issues. And if they haven't had issues up until now, they're going to have issues at some point. You have to on a motorcycle. You have to be picking your lines. you got to be really, really sharp. Four-wheel vehicle, not as bad. And then you usually got somebody with you. So um, unless you go old school, uh, you know, like Ivan Stewart and some of those guys that, you know, solo in the trucks or in their buggies and whatnot. And, you know, they had to memorize all of that stuff. There was no you know, GPS to warn them with a, with a marker on it and a, audible alerts and, you know, radar lines. So they know, okay, that's a hundred meters out. Okay. That's 50. Now that's 25 and no shit, you know, no, there was a lot of technology now that's both helped make the sport safer off-road racing safer. And I feel in some instances more dangerous, but that's a whole nother podcast. So anyway, um, planning the routes, Right. The big thing is, is is knowing to me, like, it's like when I come up with an idea, it's okay, we're going here. Um, take, for example, Mike Sky Ranch. That's a really popular ride down here uh, in the Baja California northern area. Um, on the weekends, busy, you know, you have to call ahead and, and, you know, good luck trying to get a room sometimes and that kind of thing, you know. And it is a really cool place to go. Uh, played out for a lot of people, but it's still the challenge of getting there and riding there and that kind of thing. And then coming up with different ways to get there. You know, there's a ton of ways to get there. So when I plan the route, I generally say, all right, well, how many miles of dirt do we really want to do? 
do we want to deal with the city? Which way are we going to go? What's the riding ability of the people that are going with us? So in planning the route, these are roads that I've previously traveled and, and been through. So I kind of know the lay of the land. So, for instance, when you take one of the higher roads, uh, Condor, going into Laguna Hansen, right? This is all roads that have been traveled by dozens of vehicles. And then depending on the time of the year, then it gets really desolate and nobody travels them. And then it gets traveled on again. And so what ends up happening is is that you get ruts, um, especially if it's after the rain, you're going to have ruts because of the mud, you know. And then you're going to have sandy areas. Same, if it's recently rained, it's hero dirt and it's the funnest stuff you'll ever ride in. If it hasn't rained, uh, now you got to be proficient in riding in sand. And not, you know, like super, but that sand will still suck you in. So you need to be on on your game. And there's long stretches of it. So, And some of it gets looser and some of it's tightly packed. It just depends on how many cars have been going through there. So you can't, you can't say, oh, well, I only go between March 22nd and March 23rd because that's, no, you just never know what the condition of the road is going to be like. So you have to be prepared and you have to talk to people that have ridden that either recently or have ridden it enough to kind of understand how that road acts and and what happens. Um, And then the other thing too, you got to remember is when you ask people like that, Hey, is this road pretty bad? Hey, how's the sand on that road? Is it, is it bad or is it, is it pretty good? No, man, there's no sand on that road. It's plain. Uh, Yes, correct. Because they're not afraid of the sand. So they don't even pay attention to it. It's just another part of the road. But to some people, um, man, it really sounds like I emphasize that. Some people just do not like riding in the sand at all. And that 100 yards might as well be 100 miles. So you have to understand who you're asking for advice, who's telling you, yeah, no worries, go for it. Because the last thing you want to do is not worry and go for it. And then now you're in trouble because this road is way rougher than you thought. And the worst thing that can happen to you is it's past the point of no return. So you don't have enough gas or enough range to turn around and come back the way you went. So now you got to go ride it. So you have to know. And if you're going to go exploring down a road that you've never been down before, which I almost turned my F-850 into a submarine. Um... You have to be ready for that too. So it all comes down to knowing your skill set, being honest with yourself about your skill set, being honest with the person that you're asking for uh, advice on what route to take, and then them not being a total dick and saying, oh, yeah, that hill climb's easy, Brad. No problem. And then next thing you know, you're looking at a vertical wall that you're supposed to trials ride a 500-pound adventure bike up. That just doesn't make any sense. So you got to watch out for that stuff. So what I've done, and I've I've done it in the past now for some time, is using um, using Google My Maps. I figure if Google My Maps will pick it up, it's a big enough road to be recognized, and the chances of it being safer-ish are much higher. You know, so it's a, a documented road, I guess you could say. I don't know what their algorithm is. I don't know how they figure it out, which roads they pick and which ones they don't. Um, but it hasn't failed me up until now. And plus, these are also roads that are popular that I know that a lot of people know and that kind of thing. So um, so the big thing is is where you want to go, knowing how you're going to get there more or less, talking to people that understand the areas that you're going to be riding in, which you should be doing anyway because if you're going riding into some remote area, you at least want to be able to <laughs> guide the search party in the right direction. So... And if you deviate from those plans, like we did uh, uh, one of those last rides uh, through there, you know, if you deviate plans, make sure you relay that. You know, hey, we're not going up to Mike's after all. We're going to go camp on the coast. And you will have a much, much better day, a much, much better ride. It'll be just that much more experience. And then the people that are tracking you and at home, they're not worried about you. Baja is a lonely place really, really fast. And it is even lonelier at night when you're in the middle of nowhere. So... It's definitely one of those things that you want to relay and make sure that you talk to people and and just communicate. Communicate what your goals are and what you're planning on doing um, so that way if something happens, you know, they know where to find the body. I mean, where to find you. So 
moving forward in, in all of these rides and, and planning and that kind of stuff, you know, you always, you're still prepared for the, the unknown. You're still prepared for, you know, having to make changes because the road is this or that or the other, you know, uh, something important I kind of learned to, um, this past, uh, week that I spent down in Baja, um, doing some work on the Baja rally is fuel mileage twice on two separate occasions. I almost ran my bike completely out of fuel. Um, actually I'm going to go with both because I'm pretty sure I heard it on the second time, kind of skip a beat as I was pulling into the gas station. So knowing the fuel range, not passing up gas stations and everybody listening to this podcast that, uh, that knows Baja is like, duh, you know, but you know, sometimes you just think, you are like, oh no, no, we're golden. You know, I'm only going up there and then coming back and then all that stuff. But the big thing on my case on the second go around was you like, I know my mistakes. I know what I did. And on the second one was, well, I rode up and down a couple times between the bivouac and the start of a section and then, uh, to the start of the next day. So I did a little bit of traveling within that. I just didn't realize that my gas mileage was going to be cut that short. And I go, man, I used to get more gas mileage. But then I look at it and go, well, wait, I'm getting 49 miles per gallon. And I'm normally only at 56. It really wouldn't have made that difference. You know, I mean, it is, you think, six miles. That's 30 miles, you know, across five gallons. It's there, but it's not really, you know. Then I, so... I started to figure out, okay, well, you know, this thing gets thirsty when you start getting up in the RPMs, duh. So you got to do fuel management is the long story of that, or the the shortcut to that long story is doing your fuel management, planning your stops, your fuel stops on the routes correctly and to where you still have room to breathe because that can turn quickly into an issue uh, if you don't. And gas stations are only so far apart down there and, you know, you have to be able to deal with it. And the last thing you want to be is on the side of the road trying to get some stranger to stop for you in a, la- in a country where you barely know the language, if you don't know the language. So it it's definitely showed me lessons uh, of how to route plan and how to do things. You know, we back in the racing days and, and doing races like the Baja 2000, right, and having to plan out the fuel stops for chase trucks. You know, where are we going to fuel up and where are we – where. Whereas, like, you do not leave here unless it's all the way to the brim on gas and you're carrying a mouthful. You know, it's like you have to know where all of these things are are, and when you need to stop to make sure that there isn't going to be any kind of issues. So my my whole thing is, is, you know, plan, prepare for the worst, and then go enjoy the best. So it's not let me down so far. Um, you know, you, you've just got to be able to adapt and, and do things and know, again, know where you're going, memorize things. And I feel like also on the mental game uh, with that, you know, it's like, okay, I have, uh, we've done a trip where it was long. We came down off the mountain. Uh, we decided to skip mics, but we were going to do the crossover road. And, you know, mentally you're tired, your, your body's starting to feel it, you know, after muscling these bikes around for so long. You're really starting to get to that point where it's like, okay, I, you know, I've realized I'm reaching the limits of my riding ability as far as time goes or the length of time that I can ride the bike, but I need to push myself to that next, okay, all right, here's the shortcut that goes down the side of the hill. We're going to go around. Okay, perfect. That means we're probably about 15 miles out. All right. Here's the field where's that cutoff that goes straight across instead of that. So you memorize these things and you go, and okay, so now mentally you're hitting these checkpoints. And you're like, all right, we're making progress. We're getting going. We're moving. We're moving. The GPS is there. I'm sure I could just stop and look at the GPS. But sometimes if you're not familiar with the screen on the GPS, you're going to look at it and it's going to look like it's exactly two minutes away. And those two minutes, because of where it's zoomed out to, is more like 25, 30, two hours. You know, you don't you lose concept of space and time uh, on GPS screens if you don't know how to read them and how to use them. So that that trick has always worked. But that also comes from back in the day from racing. It was like, okay, well, you got to remember when you get to this, you know, uh, coming down off the backside of Mike Sky Ranch, uh, Walker Evans Corner, you know, everybody's been down there. Uh, they should open a bar down there. That's how many people have been down there. If they open a bar down there, they're going to have visitors every race for sure. And the whole deal with it is, is 
It's not a big deal. It is a left-hand turn that's slightly off camber on a road that's a little bit dusty, but hard packed. So what happens? You come in hot to the corner, you hit the brakes, and the car goes, no, we're going straight. Next thing you know, you're in the bottom of this ditch. Uh, and it's a pretty big ditch. There's some videos out there. And if you have nerves of steel and you're not riding in something that's got a higher uh, center of gravity, you can throttle out of it. I've seen videos of a couple of trucks uh, doing that. And I've seen buggies do that. And you can throttle out of this thing. You basically just climb up the side of the mountain. But for many, it doesn't work that way. I've seen UTVs go over. I've seen you know Baja bugs. I've seen all sorts of stuff go over that. So what am I getting to with that? Oh, it's easy. You follow the power lines, and when the power lines cross over from the right to the left, that's the corner. Literally right before the corner, the power lines cross over from one side to the other. So that's how you would memorize where things were. You had to use some kind of reference. Lucky there, because otherwise, I mean, what is it? Oh, yeah, it's the sixth bush with the second uh, rock, you know, stacked on top of each other. You make a rack stock or a rock stack. You know, that's like telling people, it's like, oh, yeah, it's the third OXO on the left. It's like, there's like 50 of them. How do you, you know. So memorizing those things can be very important. And you don't have to ride through it to do it. You can just pick your way from the satellite image and kind of know. Now, if it's a construction site or something that you feel like, like really, really be honest with yourself and think about it. Is this going to change over the course of the next few weeks? Look at when the satellite image was taken. When did you go in there? When did you plan this trip? What did the satellite image date say? You know, is this was this taken ten years ago? Yeah, that's kind of rough. You know, that abandoned ranch ten years ago might not be an abandoned ranch now. You know, so there's definitely a lot of work and pre-planning that goes into it. You can plan around. You can throw a GPS file out there. You can do all of that stuff. But if you can't warn people about what it's like, you know, be honest. You know what the road type is like and. And I would refer or I would refrain, I think is a proper word. I would refrain from using things like, oh, it's easy. Oh, it's hard. Oh, it's this. Because that that's open to the eye of the beholder or, or that's objective from the person that's riding that trail and riding that, you know, for them, their abilities and what they do. But if you can warn, hey, you know, this section's pretty rocky, that you got a pretty rocky uphill, or you've got a rocky uphill, you've got sand on this, there's long sand straights, things like that. Well, don't say easy sand. Oh, yeah, man, it's an easy sand straight. Well, yeah, because for a lot of people, you put the thing in third gear, you sit on the back seat, and you just hold on for dear life. You know, and it's a great ride and everything. But for the guy that's riding behind you that doesn't like riding in sand, he's in first gear doggy paddling this thing. And, you know, so. You have to understand that kind of stuff. You got to watch out. You got to, you know, if you're going to recommend a ride to somebody, if you're going to lead a ride for somebody, you know, that kind of thing. So I try in the routes that I have up on chasingwaypoints.com and the more that are coming, it's the same thing as like, I'm not trying to tell you it's easy, it's hard, or it is what it is. I'm just trying to tell you what the terrain is like. And you have to decide for yourself whether or not that's something that you want to attempt. This is adventure riding. You know, this isn't driving or riding to the 7-Eleven or to the local coffee shop. I won't use the name because then I don't want to get, you know, dragged across the mud. Um, so anyway, uh, it's something that you have to be cognizant of when you are or conscious of that when you're talking to somebody about the routes that you're planning on taking or what you're going to be doing. And I'm like, hey, yeah, man, come with me. You don't know their riding ability. You don't want to make sure you're open with them about it. So the best thing I can say, at least for me, what's worked, the, the kind of the recap of it is I'm using Google My Maps. Then I look for a GP or a KML or KMZ, which is the file that uh, Google My Maps will spit out. And then I and uh, well, so what I look for is a converter that will send that to a GPX file or turn it into a GPX file, a GPX file. Now I can load it into my Garmin, uh, I use the 276 CX on top of the KTM, uh, and then I use the Garmin InReach Mini. So both of those, I load the map in the Garmin 276, and then I also load the map online to the Garmin uh, InReach website. The map for me on the bike, then I've got the map for the people that are tracking me at home, you know, or want to know where I'm at. Hey, this is the intended route that we're supposed to do. 
you know, and they go in there and they check, okay, cool, he's on route. Oh, what the hell is he doing over here? Looks like he's riding off into the sunset. So those are the kind of things that you want to be like, all right, how am I relaying information? And then actually using it. It's like if you're going to send somebody a GPX file, like here, oh, here's the GPS file of it. Well, how do you know that they don't use Lawrence and they use another type of GPS file and GPX won't work? You know, this is always like things that, you know, if you're going to go technical, if you're going to go full on with it and you're going to do all this stuff, you want to make sure that the information is out there. Um, if you use Google My Maps and they have a Gmail, you can send them the map. You can send literally from there. You can send, okay, this is the map. Again, where do I send the search party? You know, make yourself easier to find. And that, you know, the more information that's out there is the better. You know, if I ride, I ride with a two-way radio. Whether I have it on or not, I'll throw it in the bag. And why? Because if I get into a pinch, I know that I can turn that thing on, put it on Weatherman 15265, 15365, 151625. I know I can get on Weatherman, and if it's not a rancher, it's going to be a local. It's going to be somebody coming down uh, with one of the, you know, 332 tour companies uh, that operate in Mexico, you know, there's going to be somebody on that channel. So I know I'm, I'm, I'm putting some weight on that, but you know, it's one more option, but you know, at least I'm on roads that are traveled roads that are known, uh, and things that, you know, are not so desolate and remote, uh, compared to some of the other stuff that's out there. So, that's pretty much the recap on that, you know, uh, Google My Maps, share your information, make sure that people understand where you're going to be going. Um, you know, if you're bringing somebody along, be honest with their, uh, with your description of what you're going to be riding. Refrain from using easy, hard, super simple, not that bad, kind of tricky, um, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, save those for other conversations uh, after the ride. You know, just be honest with, you know, hey, like there's some rock faces you got to climb. There's some sand we're going to have to deal with. There is some and then let them decide whether or not. And if you're on the receiving end of that information, make sure you're honest with your skill set and ability before you say, yeah, let's do it. Because especially in some of these places, if you go down and you break an arm. It's going to be a long time before somebody gets you. If you come in hot to a corner and slide this thing off the mountain is going to be a long time before somebody comes and gets you. So don't overestimate your riding ability. Be honest with yourself. Uh, if you're leading the ride, make sure you've got stuff in place. Like you've got local numbers, you've got things that, you know, you have some resources and you have some things of where you're going and you have a plan. The worst thing is being caught down there without a plan. And I say caught down there because most of the riding is Baja that I do. Um, when I get on a ride, but the, that it applies everywhere, you know, anywhere in the world that you go. And if you're going to be riding in a remote area, which that's kind of what adventure bikes are for, um, you want to make sure that, you know, you, you've done your best to relay the information. So, so anyway, so I'm not sure how many minutes that is doing a new podcast platform here. Uh, that doesn't tell me what it is. I can tell you that it is 1,134 bars long so far. So I will leave it at that for episode number two. Episode number three, working on a topic. We'll see if we're doing story time or if we're going to be talking with one of uh, one of my good friends and doing an interview. So we're going to figure that one out. If you haven't already, please like, share, subscribe the podcast. Uh, if you have ideas for future topics, or anything like that, or anything you want to know, want to hear, or not hear, uh, go ahead and look for me on social media, at Chasing Waypoints, uh, on Instagram as Chasing Waypoints underscore official, also on the YouTube, uh, Chasing Waypoints. So, again, thank you very much for listening. This is episode number two of the Chasing Waypoints podcast. We will see you guys next Sunday for episode number three.